All right. Good morning, everybody. And today we're going to talk about reclaiming fortresses. So if you made a fortress, you've and then gone to save it and looked in that menu, you've probably seen some options like retire fortress, abandoned fortress to ruin. Uh, and I guess we'll quickly go into that. So retiring is kind of like putting your fortress on autopilot, and then you can come back to it later. And in the meantime, you can uh, play a different fortress in that world. Abandoning means you give up, like game over, uh, the dwarves leave, they never try to come back. Um, and both of these, well, retiring saves the fortress for you to come back to, but abandoned sites become uh, sites. Uh, I should have said abandoned fortresses become sites on the map. Uh, and that means that you can interact with them, they you know affect the map, and you can reclaim them. And you, an interesting thing about running a longer history in Dwarf Fortress, so like if you let, when you're creating your world, if you let it run for like a hundred years, is that the game will also do this. The game will run fortresses, and that's what we're looking at here. Um, this is actually when you reclaim a fortress that the game itself has made, because you made a new world, let it run for a hundred years, and so the game ha was playing Door Fortress with itself, basically, made these fortresses, and then decided that certain ones were abandoned, were, were um, game over. And in this case, on this map, they were all game over because of forgotten beast attacks. I'm not, there may be other reasons, you know, like sieges, any reason that you might have a game over. Um, but uh, in this case, it was all forgotten beasts. So what I did was I reclaimed a fortress from the game that... Uh, was abandoned after 17 years, I believe. It said that they made 17 years of progress and then a forgotten beast wiped them all out. And I've actually already met this forgotten beast. We have footage of this forgotten beast. He's, he's in the thumbnail. He is now our pet. He wasn't that scary. That's the thing. He So in his confirmed kills, he has like 53 kills, and that's in the lore of this game. He showed up to this fortress from the very shallow caverns, actually. The, the caverns start almost right at the surface, um, which is nice in some ways. But he killed all of the auto-generated dwarves. But the auto-generated uh, AI dwarves did not have the same brilliant idea I did, which was after he chases a dwarf into a room the first time and kills him, uh, set both of those doors to forbid, and then wall them over, and then dig in from the top. So now we have a Sarlacc pit. And if you've watched all my Dwarf Fortress videos, you know about the Sarlacc pit. The Sarlacc pit... Uh, is obviously a reference to Star Wars, and it describes a situation where you have a safely entrapped monster and a pit, a, a dwarf fortress pit, above it, so that any prisoners, anything that you don't want anymore, uh, goes in, and the the forgotten beast, which is just chilling there, it doesn't it doesn't starve or anything. It's just chilling there. It's very angry that it's uh, trapped, but it'll it'll just eat, eviscerate anything that goes in there, and then usually heal up and just be. Um, basically like a organic uh, bio garbage disposal kind of thing. Um, so, But you can see, so here are some of the pros. Here's why you would want to reclaim a fortress. As you can see, this fortress is very neatly planned out, and it is very um, well-equipped. There's like rooms full of statues. Um, there's like bedrooms full of nice clothes. Uh, this is right at the beginning of the embark. So it's a prefab. It's a prefabricated fortress for you that you just have to explore. Um full of stuff. This is a pro and a con, and I'll talk about that now. So I had no issue with, with the Forgotten Beast that had claimed this um, fortress, because I just locked him in a room. You would think that would be the hardest part, right? But actually, what I found was the hardest part was when I reclaimed everything, all these items, the value of my fortress went from like zero or whatever, you know, like imagine a small number like five, that's the average seven dwarves showing up to a new place. But then as I had my dwarves reclaim all of this nice stuff that you're seeing, um, you see the two cheese rooms. So here's a, a quick interesting fact about the cheese. The cheese that wasn't in the stockpile rotted much faster. Uh, and I think the cheese that was not even in a barrel but sitting in that stockpile never rotted. So move your cheese to stockpiles quickly. I just got distracted. I forgot what I was saying. Oh, so the main, the main um, challenge of this was not actually that built-in forgotten beast. It was, in fact that the value of my fortress skyrocketed so hard that in the first few migrant arrival ro uh, rolls of the game's dice, you know, internal dice, I w immediately was given, like, 30 migrants, 30 migrants, because it's trying to catch up to, you know, it's saying, like, oh, how, how nice is this fortress? How attractive would this fortress for new migrants be? And it was like, oh, you know, it's a new game. And then the next time it rolled, it was like, whoa, I owe this guy, like, like a million migrants. And so the problems that that has caused is... Um, 
can quickly turn into a tantrum spiral because I have to very quickly and by surprise set up a lot of bedrooms and more to all the amenities. Um, they ate me out of house and home because I, I went from like seven dwarves and food stocks that are appropriate for that into like um, immediately zero everything because all the migrants showed up and immediately started eating stuff uh, and drinking stuff and I just wasn't prepared for it. And um, there was something else. Oh, they're getting themselves hurt in the cave a lot. So the cave is dangerous, but okay. So this is right there on the video. It says an ambush, drive them out. And you get that alert when something is sneaking, is stealthing towards you. And we were getting that early on and we didn't know what it was, but it was in fact this forgotten beast stealthing, stealthing in. And then randomly, I was very confusing because suddenly he's like deep in your base and eating somebody, but that's because he su successfully, uh, it's hard to say. He successfully stealthed in. There he is. Now we're looking at him. So my forgotten beast in this case, and he's killed 60 dwarves right there. He just ate one. And he ate another one. I think I don't think I saved this one. I think this was, was me experimenting with him. Yeah, because see, he's already out. So that room to the south uh, that he returns to right there is where we end up successfully locking him in. But this was a trial run. And the weird thing was he was actually eating troglodytes on his way. I was finding dead troglodytes, and I was like, oh, man, what is happening? And he was just so stealthy. Uh, so this beast is a eyeless, poisonous bite frog. Uh, you can't tell from that image because he looks like a, some kind of dragon demon. But in the description, we'll see he is just kind of like a cave, a blind cave frog with a poisonous bite. And um, he, we end up blocking him in this room. And don't worry, we don't save this version where dwarf after dwarf wanders in and is eaten. Uh, but... Uh, just as a show of strength, I guess that's a tradition now on my channel where I will do a save scum version where all of the dwarves die to some monster just to show, just to show what can go wrong. Um, but so I dug, there you go. That's me. Uh, oh, and that's all my saves. So, uh, let's see. Ba -ba -ba. I'm just checking to make sure I didn't say anything too embarrassing in any of these. No, those all seem normal. Okay. We're going to keep going. Um, I mean, the only embarrassing thing is that I do save hundreds and hundreds of times, but I stand by that. I mean, I got plenty of hard drive space. And it helps me cover up mistakes. So what was I saying? Oh, so we saved him in that room and um, dug down from this level that I, we're actually looking at now. And yeah, it's just a pit. So you can just drop things in and they will go, they will go away. Uh, so what? Um, okay, pros. Yeah, so pros. A lot of workshops already set up, as you can see. You don't have to spend time on that. Cons of, of reclaiming a fortress randomly, you, you will not have the workshops you want. So, like, you'll get work orders stuck and be like, oh, they never had any stills, I, or I can't find these stills. I don't know if it's, like, workshops uh, when you abandon if other ones decay, and maybe only these metalsmith ones stick around. That might make sense, actually, if it's, like, a, a fire-safe material or something, some tag on it, because all I found in this were, like, really, really ample... Um, anvil workshops mostly and no carpenters or stills or kitchens or anything so actually as i think about that that might be why why that happens um so what was i saying e everything about reclaiming is kind of like a pro and a con thing because like as you can see th they immediately build in a uh, forgotten beast but it's pretty easy to trap and that's cool um this this thing starts with magma fortress it starts all the way down to the magma level but so your map constantly has enemies that like a brand new Fortress are probably not ready for. Oh, that was another thing that the migrants were causing trouble with. Um, so once there were suddenly 50 of them, they were using these little sneaky paths that I had previously been able to use through the caves where a dwarf would just skirt through there, not affect, not like antagonize any of the wildlife and get back out. And we didn't have to like fish that much or anything because there was only seven of them. When there's 40 instead, now I'm like, oh God, somebody go fish because we need fish. You know, somebody go hunt. Somebody, you know, we got to make drinks. I'm like in panic mode to feed everybody. And so a bunch of dwarves who are brand new here wander down to the caves, uh, piss off the wildlife, get pulled into the pond by grabbers, and I'm not watching. So it's like my population goes from 7 to 60, and then suddenly from 60 it's going 59, 58, 57, 56, and then, you know, like I'm, I flip my eyes away from it, and now it's back down to 30. Uh, and then everyone's very traumatized, and now we're in a tantrum spiral, so thanks, Thanks uh, to all the newcomers. It's my own fault. I reclaimed too quickly. So let that be a lesson. If you reclaim all the stuff in a big, nice fortress that was abandoned, the game is going to go, whoa, this guy just won the lottery. You know, it's like when you, if you uh, win the lottery and then you hear about, like, every, uh, everybody's, like, 
the winners, their family and friends all come out of the woodwork to be like, hey, give me some of that. And it ends up kind of like ruining everybody's life and just leaving hurt feelings. That was this fortress in a nutshell. And it's a shame because we did lock up. Uh, so one cool thing that I noticed is Forgotten Beasts, when they spawn on your map in the other uh, menu, they're referred to as uninvited guests, which is a, you know, a cute little euphemism for it. But in this one, because we were the ones who showed up and he was already living there, it actually says um, current resident. So this is his, technically until we kill him, this is his fortress. But we've got a roommate situation now. So one thing that I discovered that was really interesting um, when I reclaimed this fortress, and I, I guess I, re, I had reclaimed uh, game-generated abandoned fortresses before, but I never really picked up on this, is that it does give you little hints about how to play. Some of the official in-game architecture, there you can see our, our guest, or the resident, is, is locked up in his room. Uh, he's officially pitted. Um, but so I didn't... Re the way that the game generates fortresses can give you hints about maybe how you could ideally generate fortresses. So like an example is, if you've seen in my other videos, you, the way that I make bedrooms is kind of work intensive and does not allow for the multi-paint tool to be used because I don't actually enclose each one with walls and a bed. The game actually sets up huge like dormitories, of like apartment buildings of private rooms. You'll see those in here. And then the multi-paint tool really kicks in and you can... Uh, uh, as long as each one has a bed, you place a bed for each one, you still have to do that, but you don't have to make a million little uh, cubes in the zone zone painter. Uh, you can just paint the whole Z level, and it'll it'll find every bedroom and assign 90 bedrooms if there's 90 little rooms. Um, another thing is like, so this, this fortress has a, has a spiral staircase that goes straight, or ramps technically. It has a spiral ramp that goes all the way down to the magma sea, to the magma uh, layer. And it's like walled off from the caverns, so you can breach those when you want to. It's really, really well designed. Um, and even in that spiral staircase, it has a column like of open air that goes all the way down, which I found useful right here. You'll see. Um, just it seems to be built in like a built-in waterfall, so the dwarves can walk this ramp in a corkscrew all the way down to the center of the earth, basically, almost. You know, uh, and that's fed by a underground lake right there. So um, it's never going to run out. It has, you know, floodgates so I can turn it off. But yep, it just goes down a million Z levels. Not a million, literally, but basically all the way down to the magma layer. I, I was thinking about just carving it open so that the water actually does, like, hit the magma and maybe start making an obsidian platform. The only thing is that that might, um... Well, I was going to say that might ruin the magma forges that are already built by the game there. But who cares? If I can get down there on, like, a floor of, of obsidian, I think um, I could just carve through that again and get my magma forges going again. So maybe I'll do that, actually. My waterfall is goes straight down, and, um, yeah, there's just one layer of stone connecting it on the magma forge level that uh, separates it from the magma sea. I guess I will do that. All right, well, since, yeah, since my fortress is already spiraling out, I'll try to get some footage of that and put it in the community tab or something. And maybe I can save it. Maybe I can rewind with all my saves and um, figure out this migrant situation that so plagues me. This is not, and this is not a political video. I don't have any uh, feelings about dwarf immigration, but um, this was just a, a there's, there's my dormitory, uh, dormitory with uh, auto painting bedrooms. This fortress can support that many. I just, you really have to, it, almost like driving like a manual transmission car, like you have to ease these migrants in, take them out of the mechanism or the gears are going to grind and then like slide them back in just right into the machine because uh, otherwise you're going to get what I got, which was just a um, a land rush, basically. All these random uh, dwarves I never met running in, getting themselves killed in the caves, uh, starting fights. Oh, the other thing, I don't know if this is a um, reclamation thing, but I got so many volunteers, humans constantly wandering in, offering to slay monsters, like, you know, Witcher, Witcher type dudes ro uh, rolling in and being like, yeah, I'll kill monsters. And a lot of them get, get killed as we were taming this because this cave is pretty wild too. I mean, uh, I've seen serpent men, which wiped the space I had to start over. There's, of course, the Forgotten Beast. There's also been, like, I don't know, their babies or something, because there's... So this, this Forgotten Beast is a giant, truly massive uh, blind cave frog, but there's also normal, quote-unquote, giant cave frogs. Um, there's pond grabbers. Like I said, when I first set the migrants, the, new, uh, the, the huge 
uh, immigration wave when I was like, okay, then we're going to need food. So everybody, you know, go gather food. Um, everybody got pulled into the pond by pond grabbers. It's a very hostile cave. Um, but it's interesting enough, you know, if you've watched my channel, you know that I have like six, six maps and they're all interesting and challenging in their own way. I, if I wasn't so distractible, I'd make more progress on each one, but, um, I don't know. I like, I just like doing new embarks. Oh, I owe, um, shout out. So I've been promising one of my viewers an undead whale in a cage since, well, I, I didn't promise I could do it, but I promised that I would try. And so now I, I know you're going to see this video, um, saltwater. And I apologize. It, I, I'm pretty sure it's saltwater who's been bothering me about it. And if that's wrong, I'll, I'll pin it in the comments uh, as a correction. But um, I think saltwater is the one who's been who's been demanding an undead whale in a cage. Um, I every time I embark now, I specifically for you will run an embarkment search for evil oceans, just in case, just to keep an eye out for that Moby Dick, that rare white whale, just so maybe I can come back, uh, the conquering hero who does any insane thing that the viewers ask ask him to do. Um, that's, I think that's all I got. Reclamations can be good. You got to do them carefully. Main thing, don't reclaim too quickly. Like it's really, it's a discipline test. Cause it's like, you know, if you had an infinite access to all the items you wanted, could you only take what you needed for your first seven dwarves or maybe for 14 dwarves for the immigration to proceed normally? At least that was for me. Maybe there was some other, um, confounding circumstance maybe you know we were right on the border of a dwarven city or something else that also triggered that but um that wiped me out more than the current resident who will by the way if it's like my fortress who will with very high stealth sneak up on you and um cause a huge problem but hopefully it'll it's kind of, it becomes kind of like a game of among us at that point where like as long as you can isolate as long as he doesn't reveal himself in the middle of an operation and everybody panics and uh, is in big trouble. If you spot him as one person goes down and you hear the, the dying scream and you can isolate him, really not that much of an issue. As long as mine also only had a poisonous bite, if it was able to fly or if it had uh, poison breath which or you know fire breath that it could expel or if it could break construction so it could break down the door or break down the wall behind the door, I would be in a lot more trouble. This would be a lot harder, and I wouldn't be able to act as tough about having just locked the doors behind it. Um, I think that's all I got for this one. Uh, I definitely recommend you check it out. So to reclaim one of these, to get one of these for yourself, all you have to do is run a world with history, let the game kind of play itself for, you know, 100 years. That's how much I did for this one. If you look, we're on year 101. So yeah, I've been here for a year. The game played this fortress for a uh, hundred years, or technically only 19 years, I think, is when it started playing this one. So, But it ran this for 20 years, and it's a cool little fortress. Um, and if you can if you can do it right, if you can get in there, it's very, very secure, has lots of things you need. It's very, it can be very interesting. Um, thanks for watching. If you made it to this point in the video, uh, please always, as always, like and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, I really appreciate everybody um, as these subscribers grow. Let me know if you have an idea for a subscriber special and don't say undead whale in a cage because I can't promise you that I will definitely do that for, you know, 500 subscribers or something like that. But something that I could do, I'll do because I appreciate y'all. Um, thanks for joining me on this and I will catch y'all in the next one. Have a good one.